We're here with Sarah Beth Perry, who is the founder and CEO of Base Health, a natural health company focused on unlocking the potential of hemp for health. And today we're going to talk about um, using cannabinoids with a thyroid condition, some of the myths that surround this topic, and what doctors have to say about it. Uh, Sarah Beth has a really interesting educational background and professional background. She also has a really interesting um, health journey that she's been on. And so Sarah Beth, I'm hoping to start, you can tell us a bit more about you, what you do, um, and the journey you've been on that's led to founding BASE. My personal history really led into my professional history, career, et cetera, um, health has always been something that I've just been acutely aware of, um, mainly because when I was 18 months old, I was um, diagnosed with neuroblastoma, which is a type of childhood cancer. Um, and, you know, thankfully, everything with that is all good. Um, I stopped, you know, going to official checkups when I was seven. Um, and, you know, having that as kind of a, you know, framework or book book ending, book beginning, I guess, for my life and something that I was told a lot about from a young age just always made me very aware of health. And also, um, it just the, always the idea of like, wow, things could be so much worse for me. Um, and that kind of has always carried with me as I guess something like that would. Um, and yeah, I, I, I mean, really, when I was younger, health was something I took for granted, I think, because I was a professional, not professional, but, you know, highly competitive amateur figure skater from the time I was five to 11. So during that, you know, I was in my peak physical shape, but also dealing with a lot of injuries and having to constantly be on top of my health, which as a child, like, it's strangely easy if you just do all the things. <laughs> like I was a super, super fit kid. And, and then as I started to get older, like you, I think this happens with everyone, but just you become increasingly aware of the frailty of your body. And with that comes increasing gratitude for the mobility and health that you do have. So I had a benign bone tumor in my right fibula that I had to get blasted out um, with an experimental um, treatment out of U of M. And then from there I developed RSD, which is reflex sympathetic dystrophy, which basically just meant my leg hurt all the time and nothing was actually wrong. Mm. And then I actually did develop a stress fracture from that afterwards. Um, and so that ended my skating career, but then, um, you know, I, I would have fainting spells all the time from low blood pressure. And then in college, um, you know, I developed a thyroid nodule literally out of nowhere. <laughs> and, uh, one of my friends pointed it out to me and was like, Hey, you look like you have a goiter on your throat. You should probably get that mm. checked out. Totally non-cancerous. So I was like, okay, this is a win. <laughs> and then, um, I had to get that taken out. And that has kind of been like the backbone of my, um, you know, thyroid journey, per se, but all these experiences with health just, I think, informed the way that I looked, look and currently look at the world. Mm -hmm. um, and I truly, truly believe that health is the most precious gift that we can have. Um, and I'm so grateful that like, I'm very healthy now, like everything is, for the most part, completely in my control. Um, but that kind of took me on a journey to wanting to work in health somehow. I thought I was gonna go to med school. So my last two years in college, I went pre-med. And then um, before I kind of went down that route, I found a really cool uh, master's program at Duke in North Carolina that studied the intersection of theology, medicine, and culture. And it just totally combined everything that I was interested in, in terms of the human experience, getting to understand um, from a lot of my colleagues and professors who were practicing physicians, what it was like to work with lots of humans who were ill all the time. And um, that 
led me to having my first career in clinical research at Mount Sinai, where I was helping to build a home-based palliative care program for people with multiple chronic illnesses. Um, and long story short, I developed relationships with a lot of the patients and a lot of the caregivers and a resounding um, question and sentiment, a lot of, you know, that was a lot of the times posed to me was how can I use cannabis? And I've heard about this thing called CBD, but how can I use it safely? Mm -hmm. um, and I think what struck a nerve for me was that back in 2018, when the farm bill passed, there were a lot of um, companies coming out mainly focused on the wellness and um, yeah, like health and wellnessy aspect bath bombs, um, oils, lotions, mm -hmm. and those things are great and totally have their place. Um, but I was thinking from the perspective of the patients that I was working with, um, thinking about what would be a safe way for them to try CBD in a world where a lot of the, the healthcare system isn't totally ready for that conversation. Um, primarily because doctors aren't trained on the endocannabinoid system and, um, you know, don't, don't feel comfortable liability wise, um, recommending it necessarily. And so, yeah, in a nutshell, <laughs> that was kind of the basis for base. The foundation for base was how can we improve the efficacy of a consumer product and provide people with evidence-based methods for incorporating this into their lives in the safest um, and most effective way possible. I think um, for the sake of this conversation, it'd be interesting if you could break down like what is the endocannabinoid system? So it was identified in the 1990s. Obviously cannabis has been around forever, um, but the endocannabinoid system itself um, is just really starting to be cracked open. And, um, it's, you know, the, the, the definition of it is a complex cell signaling system. And what that kind of means is that it is a system by which your body produces endocannabinoids, which are endogenous to your body. So this doesn't have to do with cannabis, CBD, any cannabinoids at all. On your own, your body produces endocannabinoids and um, they interact with um, the cell receptors. So mainly they're CB1 and CB2. CB1 is found mostly in the central nervous system and CB2 is found mostly in the peripheral nervous system, mostly immune cells. Um, and then there are enzymes that break down the endocannabinoid system. So between the endocannabinoids, the receptors and the enzymes, all of your body, um, they're talking to each other and helping communicate certain messages to your cells at the highest level. Um, we're still trying to figure out more about it. And that's a whole conversation about research and why we don't know more about it. Um, but so far we know that it plays some kind of a role in regulating certain functions like sleep, mood, appetite, memory, and even like reproduction and fertility. Um, yeah, so the, from the from the highest level, cell signaling system crucial to a lot of communication efforts and a lot of our um, essential functions as humans. So if our endocannabinoid oh wow, stumbling endocannabinoid <laughs> system is like internal, it's already in us. I guess the next yes. question is then how do hemp products, external products, how do they interact with the endocannabinoid system? And can you break down sort of the difference between hemp and CBD? Yes, yes. So this is what is so fascinating to me. And every time I read about it and every time that I, you know, dive into the research, I'm just like, I'm just blown away by, you know, plants and the body and how they interact with each other. So essentially your endocannabinoids interact with the receptors. Well, the cannabinoids that are found within cannabis, um, cannabis sativa L to use the proper term, also interact with the receptors. So basically the, um, the phytocannabinoids is what they're called, phyto being from plants. 
um, they interact with the receptors, they bind to the receptors, and they also, they are essentially a supplement to your body's natural endocannabinoids. So when you are, you know, partaking in CBD or other cannabinoids, um, you're, you're doing something to your body <laughs> um, and your body responds to it. Um, the interesting thing, I guess, for thyroid specifically, and this is something that's still being worked on and trying to understand more, um, is that there are specific cannabinoid receptors that are located on cells that are on the thyroid gland. Um, so there's definitely something happening there. And then there's, um, there are receptors that are identified also in the part of the brain that sends signals to the thyroid, um, that that part of the brain helps to regulate the activities of the thyroid. Um, and that's called the hypothalamic paraventricular nucleus, the PVN. So there's definitely a lot of activity within the thyroid. And I think there were, there are a few articles that, um, I think are saying there's a bit of like negative regulation. Um, but there's still a lot more that needs to be done in terms of understanding exactly how, so, um, how it works and what the signaling does. Um, but yeah, so essentially you have the endocannabinoids that are from your body, the phytocannabinoids that are from plants, and those two things both interact with the receptors and the enzymes in your body, which is mind blowing. There's actually a theory out there and I don't know how much I agree with this, but, um, there's, there's a theory that like, you know, because we, um, have these receptors that we essentially like co evolved with cannabis as a plant because it's been around for so long and there's been documentation of it being used thousands of years ago. And then there's also a theory that because hemp was artificially taken out of our society back in the 1930s, um, that we all have cannabinoid deficiencies. <laughs> and that is, it's an interesting theory. Again, I don't know how much I agree with it, um, but it, it's interesting to think about the fact that we you know, did have cannabinoids in our food system because they would use the hemp for you know, food for the cows and then we would eat the cows, drink the milk um, and hemp is just, you know, hasn't been as large of a player as it used to be. Um, in terms of the difference between hemp and CBD, that's a really great question and um, something that gets brought up all the time because of the way that I think from an industry perspective, the, the term CBD was kind of haphazardly coined in my humble opinion. Um, probably would have done something similar if I was in their shoes, not judging. But essentially, hemp has a connotation of being from textiles and rope and something that you see at the farmer's market. Um, and CBD as an acronym, um, I think, you know, was kind of put out there in, in terms of like something to sell because it was different from THC and it was easily differentiated from the psychoactive compound THC. However, um, it, it gets really confusing really fast, especially for consumers who are new to it, because that it's not accurate. It's, it's actually not accurate to call CBD CBD the way that it's sold. There are multiple kinds of CBD. There's CBD isolate, there's CBD broad spectrum, there's CBD full spectrum, um, and CBD isolate is just the cannabinoid CBD. CBD broad spectrum says that there's multiple cannabinoids and multiple terpenes, but they take out all the THC, which I um, have a little bit of a gripe with and I don't think is, um, like it, it's essentially very, very hard to completely take out 100%. You can take out a lot of it, um, but there's, it's really difficult to take out all of it. And then there's CBD full spectrum, which leaves the trace THC in, in the oil. But the most important thing I think to know, and the easiest way that I've been able to understand it when I was first, you know, entering into the industry was that you have the taxonomical, you have the taxonomy of the plant. It goes from cannabacea, which is where we get our name base, goes to cannabis, and then you have cannabis sativa and cannabis um, indica, and then it goes to cannabis, cannabis sativa L. Um, 
And from there you have hemp and, um, you know, what's commonly known as marijuana, although we don't like that term. Um, and those two are technically part of the same taxonomy. And basically the only difference between hemp and cannabis is the percentage of THC. So 0.3% or less, it's hemp, 0.3% or more, it's marijuana, cannabis. Um, yeah, and the, the, there are some more technical differences, but that's, that's essentially it. So um, hemp technically is, um, you know, it, it still has all the cannabinoids in a oil that is from hemp and in an oil that's from um, cannabis, you still have all the cannabinoids. It just depends on the, the different levels in there. And I think <laughs> even breaking down like what to, you see labels at like the grocery store now or online and, and understanding what you're even looking at. I'll ask you later what someone might want to be looking for. Um, yeah if they're looking for hemp products, but I think that's a good place to start understanding sort of these differences. Well, and it's I, also very confusing too. Products will sometimes be sold as hemp oil. And that that is most likely a different thing than hemp extract. Mm -hmm. And that's a differentiation that like, none of this has been professionalized or, or at least officially categorized by anyone. So someone could be selling something called hemp oil and it has cannabinoids, even though I like that would not be a good decision, I think, from a marketing perspective. And then someone could be selling hemp oil and it's just the oil from the seeds. There's no cannabinoids. Right. And that gets really confusing for people, especially when, you know, you see things being sold on Amazon and it's like really expensive, but then you look and there's no cannabinoids. Um, definitely gives a bad name for the industry. Um, but it is super, super confusing to navigate as a consumer for sure. I mean, even just hearing you talk, it sounds like murky to try and figure out what, what is this product and is it the right product for me, where it may also be confusing for a lot of people is like there's cannabinoid use was sort of taboo for a long time. And I think it still is in many totally places. And there's a misunderstanding about um, the difference between CBD and THC and this sort of thing. I'm wondering if you can tell us a bit about some of, some of these myths or these confusions yeah. that people might have or assumptions they make about hemp and CBD. Yeah, yeah, sure. So and I, I think this is really an interesting question and point because the 2018 Farm Bill um, federally legalized um, the, the like growing of, or this, you could basically set up farming programs state to state to grow um, hemp-based CBD. And I say hemp-based CBD because you can technically create a product with the same ratio of cannabinoids, CBD, CBG, CBC, THC, and then have the same exact oil, CBD, CBG, CBC, THC, the same milligram amounts. But if they are extracted from a plant that has, um, by dry weight, more than 0.3% THC, it's, it's not considered CBD. So even if it has less than 0.3% THC in the oil that comes from a plant where there's more THC, it's considered a, a cannabis-based oil. Um, but, I, you know, CBD <laughs> with 0.3% less or less THC um, is allowed. So that's the first thing. Um, and, you know, THC is really the compound that dictates a lot of the, I think, tabooness. Um, and so the first thing is just, you know, making sure that the product we're using has 0.3% or less THC. And in that case, a myth of like, you know, will this get me high? At 0.3% or less of THC, it shouldn't definitely shouldn't. If it does, then the company is more THC in the product than they're disclosing. That's something too, that we talk to our customers a lot about is like what to expect. And I think because a lot of people are new to the category, um, they are worried they're going to feel drowsy or they're going to feel tired, um, because of the trace THC. And what we say is like, you know, 
our advice, like most doctors advice is to start low and go slow. And that really reduces the risk that you're going to take too much for your body um, and experience some of those side effects like drowsiness or sleepiness. Um, so I think that's a huge one. And then um, another one that I hear a lot is, well, is it addictive? And that goes back to the THC as well um, because when something is addictive, it's usually because there's some sort of intoxicating effect. Um, and the THC is the compound that causes the intoxicating effects where you, you feel high. Um, and you know, a lot of people will say cannabis in any form is completely non-addictive. Um, and I think there's still a conversation around that because people do report sometimes like having a, um, dependency or cannabis disuse, uh, with cannabis misuse disorder or, um, you know, something where there's, there's definitely some kind of dependency. And so, you know, I think that's up for debate for our products specifically and most, you know, well standing CBD companies. Um, it's definitely not addictive, addictive, but that's definitely where, um, I'd start with most people who are new. That's yeah. I think that's, that's helpful. And those are probably the two biggest things I've, I've heard and I'm not in the industry about, you know, is it addictive? Yeah. Will I get high? Um, you talked a bit earlier about what the research says around cannabinoid, cannabinoid use, um, related to your thyroid. I'm wondering if you have any additional insight or any insight about what doctors have said about using, um, cannabinoids with thyroid disease. Yeah. And I, I think this goes back a little bit to, um, the, what I was saying at the beginning about, you know, doctors for good reason, not feeling super comfortable, um, recommending necessarily that people take CBD products. And it's a twofold issue. One, they're not doctors right now, the endocannabinoid system is not taught in medical school. Um, so for doctors who are trained to go by the book and using evidence-based, you know, practices, um, I think it feels wrong and, um, foreign to, to them to say, yeah, like, you know, take, take this thing, <laughs> um, on the other hand, you know, research has been really limited in the U S particularly because of the taboo surrounding it. So universities and even like private research groups can't get federally funded grants to do research. Um, it's really hard to, you know, get permission from, you know, private donors uh, from the university to use like private money for studies. Um, there's some exciting things coming out of um, a Harvard lab that I can link um, about anxiety and CBD, but the, it's just so limited. And, and like, there are studies from time to time but the body of work in comparison to so many other treatments per se is super limited. The one medication that is on the market is Epidiolex and that's used for children with seizures. And that is using um, high, high doses of CBD isolate. Um, and so that was approved. And I, I think there are a few more coming through soon. Um, but it's interesting because it gets into the topic of, well, is this being studied with cannabinoids from a plant, like CBD from a plant, or is it synthetic? Um, is it full spectrum or is it isolate? And so there's a lot of like, even within the whole body of work, it, it gets confusing pretty fast. And that just speaks to the complexity of introducing these multi, um, multi chemical plants into, you know, medications. And that's a broader conversation in regards to herbs um, as well. And like how we use plants because within CBD, um, and I'm getting off on a bit of a tangent here, but um, there are multiple phytochemicals that are pharmacologically active. And that just means they do things to your body. Like plants are powerful and, um, I think the way that we've been treating them up to now is a little willy nilly. Um, so, you know, that's why, for instance, we only create like a minimally, um, a, a minimal ingredient product because we want you to have all the cannabinoids and all the terpenes naturally for the plant. But I 
don't believe in adding in additional herbs because if you are trying to start low, go slow and really figure out if this is something that's good for you and good for your body, then you don't want to have, you know, St. John's wort in there as well that has like many, many pharmacologically active chemicals just in that one plant interacting as well. And um, this gets into a conversation about medication interaction as well. But essentially the general advice that doctors that I've spoken to um, say is start low, go slow. Um, and, you know, most of the time, you know, if they'll say like, if it's helping, great. Um, but don't self-medicate, like talk to your doctor, uh, make sure at the bare minimum, they're aware that this is something you are trying so that you can get your labs taken more often, more frequently, um, and keep an eye on the things that are really important for your particular situation. Well, something we talk about a lot at Paloma Health is like being in partnership with your doctor and, yeah. and being open to, to treatments or therapies or that might benefit you finding a doctor whether it's with Paloma Health or otherwise, but finding a doctor who you can be in partnership with and have a really trusting relationship and say, I'm interested in trying this. I want you to know what, what I'm doing or trying or thinking about so that we can continue yeah. to look at my health sort of as a whole. So I think totally. that's interesting to hear what you're saying about like research coming out and new medications coming out and sort of this evolution of the industry. And while that's happening, while there's not a ton of clear research, it's useful to be in partnership with your doctor. Yeah. Um, it, to manage it, your so, particular case. Yeah. Like being, a, I mean, whether this is for better or for worse, being your own advocate is so important. And I know that's really hard for a lot of people because I mean, everyone's so busy and everyone has way more on their plate than should be humanly allowed. Um, but you know, you got, you got to do it because, um, it's just, it's important for, um, you to have the, you know, your best health and, um, yeah, yeah. It's just super important. So totally agree. I think, um, to follow up what you've just said, like you have shared a bit about your per personal health history, your history with thyroid condition. I'm wondering if you can share with those who are watching, um, about your personal experience using cannabinoids, its yeah. effect on either your thyroid health or your related symptoms and just your personal experience, what it's been like for you. Back when I um, discovered I had the nodule and then had it taken out and you can still see my scar there. <laughs> um, they, they did a really nice job. On this, so it's fading nicely. And I put a ton of sunscreen on it always. Um, it it was, it was interesting because I think the, the biggest reason that I started using cannabinoids was for anxiety. And while, you know, that really only started after my issues with my thyroid, I don't, I, I don't necessarily, um, you know, think it was because of my thyroid issues. There, there were a lot of environmental factors going on, like you know, my job was super stressful. I was commuting two hours a day. I was in living in a big city for the first time. And, um, you know, th th there was just a lot going on that was hard for me to handle. Um, and it was kind of the first time where I, you know, I thought I had felt being stressed or anxious before, but like having a panic attack in the middle of the night where I had to like the, the worst time for me with anxiety stress was like, I, you know, I get a rush of stress, cortisol, whatever. And then I can feel it like pumping through my veins. And there was one night where I was just circling, 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 thinking, 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 and I woke up in the middle of the night and just could not snap out of the cycle for whatever reason. I don't even remember what I was thinking about, but it's something related to work. And I had to go out in the living room and just like turn on a meditation chime timer and like count like one to five and back like for 45 minutes. And then like, I finally started to calm down. Um, but that feeling was just, I, I never wanted to experience it again. And I had never been like someone who used cannabis, frankly. Um, I just didn't do it growing up. I was 
really like, you know, I was skating all the time when I was younger and that kind of led into me being very, you know, adverse to risk when I was in, you know, high school, college, you know, a little bit, but not, not, not really at all. Um, and so CBD was just something I tried because I was trying everything. Um, and I think the best way to describe what it has done for me is, you know, my daily dose per se. And I'm at the point now where I don't take it every day. I don't think you need to take it every day if you don't need to. We have a lot of customers who do, um, especially those struggling with um, chronic pain. But for me, it's, it's like when I know, when I feel the cycle coming on in my brain, it's like I sometimes it helps to short circuit the cycle is the best way to describe it. And it kind of snaps my body into the not stressed state. So then I have time to adjust my mind, adjust my habits, make sure that like I work out that day, days, um, make sure I'm going to sleep, I'm not on my phone, like all the little things that add up because they definitely do and just gives me time to do those things to perpetuate the calm and not get into the, the negative stress cycle because when that goes overboard it's just it's just a pain getting back to normal and sometimes it can take two days and I'm at the point now where I'm just like I just don't have time for that like I don't I don't want to deal with it um I mean who does but yeah I, I think it it helps me there I, I'm definitely of the opinion and like you know I, I I'm more of a minimalist. So aside from my thyroid medication and my daily vitamins, I'm not a huge supplement person. So, you know, a lot of people find the most benefit when they take it daily. I just think if you have, like, if, if the product works, you don't need to take it daily. And that's kind of, yeah, that's my personal experience. It's, it's been helpful for sure, but it's, it's also just, you know, it's a tool in my toolbox and that's kind of how I think of it. Thank you for sharing <laughs> that experience and how it, how it feels for you. And I don't think that, I guess I do think that people watching our patients um, experience the same thing, whether it's directly related to their thyroid or not, like stress, stress, the adrenal glands of the thyroid gland are so connected that this is not an uncommon experience. And so I think that's a really yeah. interesting way to use your product or way to use cannabinoids in general. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned something, you take it for stress. You mentioned a lot of people use it for chronic pain. My next question is what should people look for if they're considering the use of cannabinoids? But I guess mm -hmm. the question before that is what are some of the reasons someone might consider using this product? Yeah, so first question, why would someone consider using this product? You know, being super transparent and upfront, this was a question that we had to really think about early on in the company. It was like, and it, it was a question we got from investors all the time, which was, how are you going to be different if you're not marketing towards a particular indication or usage? And we were getting pushed to market only for stress or market only for sleep or to own the pain, you know, world. And, you know, I, I don't know if this was completely, you know, you never know if it's the right decision, but just from our perspective, I, I wanted to be intellectually honest with customers and with people because this is a new category and we don't know right now. The truth is we don't know if this is better for sleep than it is for stress than it is for pain. So what we just say is we're giving you the best possible product and we know that it can be used to potentially help, you know, X, Y, and Z sleep stress pain. Um, so those are the three main indicators. Um, you know, a lot of people, a lot of our customers say it really helps them with focus. Um, but yeah, anxiety and pain and sleep are definitely the big, the big three, specifically staying asleep. Um, the, for women who are going through menopause, this is a really big benefit that they've reported seeing. And I'm so interested to like, you know, when more research comes out on it to talk about it more. Um, and it, it's really interesting because the hormones that are, um, 
and I'll send you this research article, but the hormones that are present during um, menopause are such that um, a lot of women like need a higher dose. Um, so we recommend you take it like a few hours, not right before bed, but a few hours before bed, because with the trace THC, it has the slight off chance that it might actually cause alertness. So by taking it a few hours ahead of time, you can bypass that risk and just have like the calmness and then, um, you know, have it help you stay asleep. Um, and then in terms of what someone should look for if they're exploring the use of cannabinoids, um, the first consideration that I would make is, you know, what, I mean, your personal circumstances, we tend to um, be partial towards people who are taking it for more of a health reason rather than a, you know, wellness or just like additional supplemental reason. Although a lot of people who do that as well. Um, so that basically just saying like, are you on additional medications? Um, the cannabinoids go through or uh, are broken down by an enzyme called P450. And that tends to, it's like grapefruit. So um, you know how people say, don't take this medication or don't eat great for while you're on this medication. It's kind of the same rule for CBD and cannabinoids. And you just want to be aware. I think the doctors that I've spoken to aren't always super worried, except for if you're on blood thinning medications like Werefin, I just do not recommend you take it. Um, but if you are on multiple medications or a medication, I would personally recommend going for a minimal ingredient product um, that has like only two or three ingredients, no fillers, no colorings, no additional herbs, um, and just go for a really high quality extraction. And there, there are multiple types of extractions. The most common is CO2 and ethanol. Um, we personally prefer a um, chemical-free extraction that infuses the oil um, into, so it infuses the cannabinoids directly into the organic coconut oil. So you don't have to go through the bypassing of CO2 and ethanol um, because that, it tends to strip the cannabinoids apart and then you have to add them back together. And sometimes you don't get the full, full profile or companies will end up adding in cannabinoids from external plants and, you know, terpenes from external plants as well. Um, so simple is best. You want to see the labs, um, like the lab results for sure. You want to, um, know what type of extraction, um, and I, I personally really prefer like no food coloring or fillers or emulsifiers, especially because a lot of CBD products have emulsifiers in them. Um, and that can cause stomach issues. The, the, the interesting thing, and um, maybe we, I don't know if this is relevant, but when we were going through the supply chain exercise and like trying to find our supply chain partners, it was really scary how little information we as like potential partners were getting from mm. um, certain parts of the supply chain. Like there were some people that wanted to partner with us that wouldn't tell us what kind of extraction they used. And it's like, that's a basic that's a basic piece that every consumer should know going into buying this. Um, and I mean, yeah, the, there's a lot that like major manufacturers will not give away for the sake of them wanting to be the only supplier out there. Um, so I would just push for as much information as possible and don't be shy about it because it's your body and you, you deserve to know. I really appreciate you sharing all of this information and sort of some of the behind the scenes of, um, oh, yeah. of the industry. I think it's really helpful for me and for other people to hear. Um, I guess my last question for you is what's next for base? Well, uh, there's so much that I'm excited about. The main thing is like, so we have the discovery pack, which is a seven day titration kit. And, um, you know, there's research around the steady state, which is how long cannabinoids stay in your body. And that's how long, you know, you're on, you, you, you take one strength at a time so that you have, you know, you really understand like what that strength feels like for you. Um, so that's, that's kind of, you know, the, the main hero product. And from there, um, we offer subscriptions. You don't have to have a subscription. We want to make it like a, a purely beneficial thing. And we, um, right now we send them in glass files, but we are moving to 
um, compostable refill packets, which I'm so, so excited for because we love our glass vials and a lot of our customers love them, but like you don't need 20 glass vials. <laughs> so that's something really exciting. And um, we've been working on the formulation for a um, really potent deep muscle balm that is going to be amazing. <laughs> it smells really good. It's also minimal ingredient using the same non-chemical extraction method. Um, and it's formulated in a way that gets deeper into the muscle because of the specific melting point. So I'm, that's, that's the main thing coming up that I'm really, really excited for, um, because we've been trying to work on it for a really long time and it's, it's now the right time to do it. But yeah, our, um, our refill packaging that, you know, we're as much as a small company can always trying to push for more eco-friendliness um, and less burden on the, on, on the consumer. So, um, those are the main things coming up, um, for us. I love it. That's exciting. As someone who lives with joint pain, I'm excited about the rub you guys are, yes. the bomb you guys are working on. So that's some. exciting. <laughs> um, if people want to find, like learn more from you or learn more about base. We are on Instagram as base collective, B-A-C-E collective. Um, and then we're on the internet, obviously, as basehealth.com. So you can go there. And then you can also email me directly if you want at sarahbeth at basehealth.com. I always try and answer as much as I can. So would love to hear thoughts, questions, suggestions, always open for it. Um, but yeah, Instagram is where we do most of our communication. And then um, our website as well. We have a little intercom chat that can, um, you know, we answer all questions there as well. So we try to make ourselves available. This has been so good. Thank you so much for sharing of all of this information. I think it's been helpful to me and hopefully it's helpful to all of those who watch this. So Sarah, but they really appreciate your time and all of your Thank knowledge. you so much for having me. Happy to.